What's going on? How are we all doing? Uh, I just wanted to come on here and kind of say welcome to the podcast. Uh, this is my second episode. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a while since I've recorded my first one. Kind of been really busy with work and just life stuff in general. And so I thought it would just be nice since I have some free time right now to just kind of sit down, give like some updates on kind of more life stuff, but mostly just kind of do uh, pretty much just a podcast. Uh, this one won't be as sports focused. I will definitely talk about sports, obviously, to open up the show, but I wanted to also kind of give my thoughts on some more current events type stuff and then also uh, just kind of diversify kind of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So one of the things that I wanted to start off with was the NFL and kind of football. And so I'm recording this on a Saturday. It is October 30th. And I wanted to talk about the Packers Cardinals games that happened earlier in the week on Thursday. Now I was able to watch that game pretty much in its entirety on Twitch I did about a 30 minute stream kind of giving a live uh, kind of focus of what I was doing. And I, my thing that I do called a companion kind of learned about it and kind of saw it uh, first on the Joe Rogan experience when they would do um, on Saturdays, they would have a whole table of people. And what they would do is they would watch a UFC event and they'd have a bunch of people that'd say, okay, Make sure you guys are tuned into watching this so you can see it as we are seeing it, like in real time. And so you can kind of go along with it with our reactions. That's kind of the idea that I had with it uh, to start off with. And I mean, since then, I've been doing it for the majority of the Thursday night football games. Some some days of the week, it's harder because I I'm, my wife and I, we get home late or we're, we're busy doing stuff. And so... Sometimes I do forget about it and I haven't prepared for it throughout the day. And I just, sometimes I don't feel like I should go on air if I'm completely unprepared, if I haven't looked anything, even into the matchup of who's playing, if I don't know who's playing. Sometimes I, I, I uh, have in the past not gone live on air. And so, but with this last one, I went on air for about 30 minutes, but then my wife was going to come home. And so I decided to, to hop off and uh, go make dinner. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my thoughts and why I've been kind of doing that. It is kind of fun. The only thing about that, that format is, is the games start at eight 20. And so that means I have to go live at eight 20 after a full day of working out and doing a bunch of stuff. And so I kind of go into doing that and then, uh, working and, and just general life stuff. And then I go into doing pretty much a full broadcast, some play by play, some just general comments and stuff like that, including commercials. And it's uh, pretty much three to four hours of just doing that after an entirely complete day of doing a bunch of other stuff. And so I get really tired uh, doing it where um, it's not really a moment where you want to be paused or anything or not talking. And so I've kind of kind of realize that it's um one of those things where you have to be like all in with it and there have been some i would say a good amount of streams where i have ended early just because i'm exhausted and i just can't really get into the into the motion and into into the game as much and so uh then i'll end the stream because when i do do streams or when i do podcasts like this one I want to be prepared and I want to be able to make it somewhat enjoyable. I know I'm not the most charismatic or, or best person who's ever touched the mic. I don't ever want to kind of bring that out. I just want to be genuine. And I feel like a lot of the content that I try and push out, I feel like for the most part is I'm very early in my career. I don't expect to be perfect by any means. Um, But I also want to be genuine. I don't want to have to put on a facade or, or be something that I'm not and trying to um, put out bad content, specifically with the Thursday night football streams. I really feel as though I do try and be honest with the audience and be like, Hey, like, I'm not feeling it. I'm pretty tired. I'm just going to go to bed. And frankly, that's 
that's kind of how I've been doing things in the past. But beyond that, I kind of wanted, wanted to talk about that gain that I did do with that limited stream. And then also just, um, just some stuff that's around me. I do have uh, an old fashioned here and these really nice uh, whiskey glasses that I got when I went to college. And it's a mixture of this kind of sweetener. It's like this um, sugar, sugar syrups called simple syrup. Simple syrup, I, I really don't measure that much. I kind of know what I like now. So it's a, a, a squeeze thing of simple syrup. And then you add a little bit of bitters. I like it less bitters. I like more sweetness than bitters. And then this one, I just added a good amount of Jameson and then three ice cubes. And this will be able to get me through the entirety of the thing. Sometimes I, because I'm talking so much, it helps loosen up my throat a little bit. Not just, not because it's alcohol or anything. It's just, I, I like to drink it and stuff like that. And then I also got my big body water bottle over here. But one of the things that I, that I did think about the Arizona game, obviously the Green Bay Packers won 24-21. And obviously every, the whole thing is going to be about that last, the last catch where Kyler Murray snaps the ball. They're pretty much on the one yard line and he throws the ball to AJ Green. DeAndre Hopkins is out of the game. And at that point, you're, you're pretty much thinking that the ball is have to go to AJ Green. He's the next receiver that's up. Christian Kirk or Rondell Moore are not going to be catching that ball. Neither is Chase Edmonds or James Conner. Those are two running backs who are not going to catch the ball in that situation. They're not going to run it. It's Kyler Murray has to win the game for them, and whoever has to catch it has got to be their best receiver on the field. That's kind of how the situation was presented. And a lot has been – I haven't listened to any sports talk about it. This is just my opinion without any outside not outside um, opinions or perspective or anything like that. But to me, it seemed like in the replays that I watched that A.J. Green was looking at the billboard or the scoreboard, uh, the, big, the big screen that's in the stadium while he was um, running the route. I think I'm just guessing maybe to see if – there was a flag call. There was a whistle that he might have heard or something going on where he thought the play was dead because he didn't turn his head around until the ball actually hit him. I think the ball hit him in his helmet and then bounced off and then it went and it got intercepted by the Packers, which was a great, great play by the defense. But pretty much throughout that entire, entire game, I really thought that it was just a really good, uh, solid game. The second half was so much better than the first half, just simply because it was so – the first half was a lot of – especially the first quarter, man. The first quarter was kind of um, just that 11-yard uh, rush by Chase Edmonds to make it 7-0. I mean, going into halftime, it was 10-7. You really wouldn't expect to see that with these two teams. Now, to be fair – both teams were pretty much out of their top receiver uh, with Devontae Adams for the Packers. And then for the Cardinals, DeAndre Hopkins, who um, he was, he did play a little bit, but he did get injured on a 55 yard pass where he did go into the end zone, but it called, got called back because of, because of him stepping out of bounds. And so I would say probably the main thing, the main takeaway that I would have from this game it's just, like I said, uh, these two teams are, are they, might, they might meet up in the NFC Championship game. And the reason why I say that is because these right now look like the two best. Aaron Rodgers, one of the best quarterbacks of all time, one of the best quarterbacks in league history. That's all been said before. But I think this year he sees the writing on the wall and he sees kind of where the season – is going and he's seeing how his career is coming to an end. Obviously he's not going to be able to have Devonte Adams forever. Maybe Devonte Adams leaves in free agency. I don't know. I don't know when his contract is going up. However, Aaron Rodgers only has limited time left in his career. And I think he's going all out balls to the wall this season, because he knows that this might be 
one of his maybe if not his last one of his last seasons where he can actually have a shot at the championship if you look at the other teams in the division Detroit Lions are an absolute joke and then the Chicago Bears and Minnesota Vikings are are okay they're they're not they're not in any threat to him maybe in next year's draft if the Lions draft a quarterback in this past draft they drafted an offensive lineman in the year prior cornerback so if this year the or next year coming up the Lions are able to draft a quarterback and actually start to play extremely well. And Justin Fields matures and he starts to become a good player. Then that window for the Packers is pretty much closed because there's no way they're going to be able to go into a deep playoff run with so many other good teams in the division. A lot of times with the Patriots, even it was a lot of times the other teams in that division weren't really that good and that's kind of been the case for the for the Chiefs in the past couple of years where you have Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs being so much better despite having a, a a below average defense and and then they would play against the Raiders who have had only I think it was one winning season in 2016 I want to say I could be definitely wrong about that but they've only had one winning season in like the past 15 years or something like that and then you have the Broncos who have not been able to get their quarterback situation fixed out. And then you have the San Diego, now Los Angeles Chargers, who uh, Phillip Rivers has always been a good quarterback for them. And they've, they've had definitely lots of success there. But it's just that idea that it's just been that one team, the Chiefs, in the past three, four, five years with Patrick Mahomes specifically, where they've had that extreme success and part of that is due to the fact that they don't have, let's say, the Patriots and Tom Brady in their division, or that they don't have Andrew Luck in their division. Just these, they just have different teams in their division that allows them to get two wins per year, which gives them a better shot to go to the playoffs and get buys and such, such things. And so, kind of to go off of that, I do want to kind of say that the. The Cardinals, who going into this game, they were definitely by far the best team in the league. And I think a lot of people would say that in in week four, when they won 37-20 over the Rams, a lot of people said maybe they can go to the Super Bowl. Because at that moment in time, I was one of those people who was like, the Rams, their defense is one of the best in the leagues. They have a great O-line. They have great skill skills positions, especially at wide receiver. They have a real shot to go to the Super Bowl. They went to the Super Bowl with Jared Goff. And now with Matthew Stafford, a top-of-the-line quarterback who we've seen year in and year out put up insane numbers with a poor franchise in Detroit, they have the actual opportunity to make it to – the Super Bowl, and I feel like once the Arizona Cardinals beat them, people were like, okay, yeah, and kind of that thing of you don't know. You wanted to see what the Cardinals would be like if they faced better teams. Now, not to say that the Cardinals played bad in this game, but I don't think that they played up to the idea that people had of them going into this game where they people thought they were the best team in the league. And when you're the best team in the league, you're supposed to beat every other team. And yeah, they were missing their top receiver. They did have some injuries in the game. But on the flip side, Green Bay was also missing players. And I mean, let me look at these stats here real quick. I mean... Passing yards for for uh, Arizona, 260. Uh, total yards, 334 compared to Green Bay. Passing yards, 184. Total yards, 335, one more. I mean, it, and even in terms of penalties, both teams had seven penalties against them. So it wasn't extremely like it was – a completely lopsided game. I felt like when both teams got into the red zone and once they were able to kind of get down it, like I said, into the red zone and kind of get on the opponent's side of the field, the Packers were just better at closing. And I think that goes all the way down to the end with obviously the AJ green catch where I felt as though 
it might have just been a miscommunication. I don't know. I don't want to put that out there that it was on somebody's fault. It looked like it was AJ Green's fault, but I don't know. I would have to talk to him and ask him what was he seeing on that play because I don't want to blame him for being like an idiot or whatever like that. That's unfair. But I do feel as though he was looking at something else, like at the billboard, some people were saying, or he heard a whistle or something like that. I have to believe it wasn't him just checking out on the play because you know you're the next best receiver on the field or the one that historically has been the best in terms of their career. It's uh, their top receivers are it's DeAndre Hopkins, AJ Green, Christian Kirk, and Rondale Moore. That's pretty much how the depth chart goes in my mind. And so when you're in that situation and you are AJ Green, no DeAndre Hopkins, you have to know the ball is going to you. And now maybe that leads me to think he heard a whistle or he might have not known what the play was. Again, I don't know. But that's just something that was extremely, extremely um, kind of kind of interesting. Also, to kind of take away from the game was in terms of injuries, Robert Tanyan, uh, he, I think this was in the third quarter, he went down with a with an injury, and he just went across the field, caught a ball, made a, made a big gain, and then he kind of went down clutching his knee. And I was like, oh, no, it was like one of those non-contact injuries. And I was like, no, he tore his ACL. And watching that, you're like, how are the Packers going to be able to win the rest of this game? And ultimately, even without Tanyan and a couple of their other players, they were able to to pretty much move down the field and take the lead with starting off the fourth quarter. And then the, the Cardinals weren't able to, um, weren't able to score after that 10 45 mark where that uh, nine yard rush touchdown by James Conner to make it 24 to 21. End of the line is Cardinals had the ball, had the last possession of the game. Uh, they, they could have. Now the thing it also is before I move on, the, the thing is that they had the opportunity and uh, the possibility of if they did, if that ball was not intercepted and it was an incomplete pass, then they could have kicked the field goal. But the fact that it was missed or, or missed by A.J. Green and then subs- subsequently intercepted, that ended the game. So that's also to keep in mind. But with that being said, I'm now since I am on Zoom, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the screen over onto my second desktop. I, I don't believe you guys will be able to see me, but with that being said, I kind of wanted to go and look at this upcoming week eight matchup. So that Thursday was the first week eight game. If this will load for me. And so uh, just pretty much go game by game, kind of give my my thoughts on each game and kind of give a give a little prediction. So obviously this first game, as you can see here, Buffalo Bills, Miami Dolphins, I think it's pretty easy to, to suggest that the Bills will win. I mean, look at the numbers. Josh Allen has been absolutely killing it, possibly an MVP candidate this year. Their defense has been absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you kind of look at the numbers that the the Bills are putting up. They're looking like one of the best teams first in, in takeovers, which is always always a huge thing. And then their defense passing. Oh man, that's gonna be it's gonna be a real, real hard game for the Miami Dolphins. And I think the Bills 13 and a half point favorite. I think in a game like this where where with keeping in mind the trade rumors surrounded around Tua and Deshaun Watson possibly being traded to the Miami Dolphins, I think this is a game where the Bills are able to cover and they're and they're probably going to blow out the Dolphins. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if the Dolphins kind of make a late game uh, attempt and 
and score a few points and do some, and do some things like that. I would, I would definitely wouldn't put that past the, um, the, uh, the dolphins, but overall, I definitely think that that game is going to be just insanely hard for the dolphins to win and even make it uh, competitive. So I would take, I definitely take the, um, the bills and that spread right there. I think it's going to be a pretty bad game. Now, another game, which is, this is a, a really interesting game is the, the Panthers and Falcons. So I don't know who's home for this game. I believe. Yeah. The Falcons are home this game. Now this is an interesting game. Cause I really don't know who's going to start for the Panthers. This game, uh, Sam Darnold quite possibly could start. Obviously this is another week without Christian McCaffrey, their best player on their team. And you you gotta think after seeing the past the past weekend with the Panthers when they basically subbed and benched Sam Darnold. Is he gonna start this game or are they gonna have, I believe it's PJ Walker, uh, a player from I think it was the XFL or AFL or AAF, one of those other other leagues previously. So and the line currently as is at Falcons minus three. Let's take a look down at kind of like the rankings. There, ha- there are some really good players on the um, on the field, specifically Deion Jones at middle linebacker for the Falcons that I know of. Look at some injuries. Uh, nothing, nothing really, nothing really happening right there. Uh, anything of concern, I should say. But I, I would have to say that Matt Ryan will be able to lead the Falcons. Probably a late game, a late game score. I, I would probably take the the um in terms of the spread, I would take the Panthers right here. I think it's gonna be a really close game and I think it's gonna be a field goal to win. One of those kind of games where it's really close in the end, just because I think Falcons really aren't that good of a team. And then the Panthers, I I think they'll be able to make it competitive, but I think in the end it'll be a field goal to win type of game and they'll they'll win by one or two points, that type of game. And then uh, the next game in the 1 p.m. slot is the uh, Bengals Jets. I'm going to say before I even open up the preview tab, I think the Bengals are going to win this game. And I think they'll win by, if the line is seven and a half, give me the Bengals. Ten and a half. Now, ten and a half for the Jets. The Jets are, I believe, in this game, they're without Zach Wilson, right? It should be listed right here. It's not listed here, but I do believe that Zach Wilson is going to be out for this game. I might have to check back on that. I might be wrong about that, but Joe Burrow, and I mean, last time I saw him play was this last weekend, but I still I still have memories of him lighting up the Jacksonville Jaguars on that Thursday night primetime game. I remember because I did a broadcast about it, and and I mean, Jamar Chase has been absolutely phenomenal this year. Uh, almost 800 yards, six TDs through basically this will be week eight. So it, it'll it be an insane game. I think the Bengals will definitely blow out the Jets. Uh, however, I would take the Jets um, if, if Zach Wilson does play. Um I'd take the Jets just to, just to kind of cover. I definitely think they'll lose, but 10 points for the Bengals is just too much. But I definitely think the Bengals will win outright. But if Zach Wilson's playing, not by that much. It's kind of my thought. And I mean, Zach, Zach Taylor, coach of the Bengals, coach of the year, quite possibly, quite possibly. Rams, Texans. All right, this is a game that I think the Rams can easily win. Uh, 14 and a half. That's a lot of points. That is a lot of points. Uh, but Matthew Stafford, uh, he's been playing so well. And I think Cooper cup is, is really good as well. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of points. I'm going to take the Texans right here. That's just too much points, even for the Rams. Uh, I just feel as though this is just way too much points, 14 and a half. Yeah, the Texans got beat super bad uh, last week against the Cardinals, but that I feel like that's too much points even for the uh, Rams to give up. I mean, looking at the rankings for the Rams, they're, they're 
super good team. Uh, so I definitely think they'll win, but I think it'll be closer than a lot of a lot of people think. Both of these teams are really bad in, in terms of their rushing, which is an interesting thing to kind of look back at. Uh, should be a big rushing day for the um, the Rams, though. So I think it will be a low-scoring game. I think I think the Rams might be able to put up 30 maybe and if they do then I would I would expect them to to cover uh but I I just think that it's not going to be that high scoring of a game I think it's going to be a lot of running and and so that's that game I'm going to final answer is Rams Rams winning outright but I'm going to take the Texans with the spread that's kind of my thoughts right here we're almost done with these one o'clock games uh eagles lions this is this is a this is a game where i definitely feel like the lions can kind of have a bounce back uh eagles minus three and a half i'm gonna take the lions right here i still don't trust the eagles i don't trust jalen hurts he's been playing really well but i just think deandre swift their leading receiver that's pretty crazy that's pretty wild i mean they TJ Watkinson, TJ Hawkinson, I should say, is not hurt. No, doesn't say he's hurt, but I mean, there's a bunch of injuries over here for um, the Eagles. Devontae Smith is probable. He's one of their top receivers. And then I, I would, I would have to go with the Lions. Not to, I think the Lions could win this game outright. I think I'm gonna take the the Lions against the. Um, Against the spread of the Eagles minus three and a half. I just, I just don't buy the, just don't, don't buy the Eagles. Don't buy them whatsoever. And on to our next game, Colts versus Titans. Uh, for me, this is a, this is a pretty easy pick. Uh, I'm going to have to go with the, uh, the Titans, but they have Colts, Colts minus one. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to take the Titans on this game against the, uh, against the spread. Uh, Derrick Henry has been playing really well this year and the, uh, the Titans defense has been, has been relatively good this year. I mean, you do look at kind of their, their past defense and that is an, an issue against Carson Wentz, but when it comes to turnovers and, and things of that nature, offensively, I'm talking about, I don't trust, um, Carson Wentz in a game like this to be able to outperform, a quarterback like Ryan Tannehill, although Ryan Tannehill isn't one of the best quarterbacks in the league, he's efficient and he's been playing pretty well the past couple of years. I mean, just even kind of looking at these two teams, the one thing I do worry about with Tennessee is that I don't want this to be a close game where they have to de depend on Ryan Tannehill to kind of throw the ball deep down the field. Because, because of right here, A.J. Brown, questionable. Their number one receiver, he is questionable for this game. I don't want to have them depend on uh, Julio Jones, who I do have on my fantasy team, might I say. But I just don't believe that Julio Jones at this age is, is still a number one wide receiver in the least, especially in terms of how he's been how he's played this year and especially with how physical the Titans are specifically starting with Derrick Henry. So I'm going to take the Titans to win this game, however, but um, if the, if the spread was something like Titans minus three, I would go with the Colts. I think this is going to be a really close game to the end, kind of like the, um, the Carolina Atlanta game where I think it could be like a field goal to win type game. And I think as a result of that, I think the Titans are going to be able to, kind of pull out for this game and then i think uh second to last one is steelers browns obviously as a writer for steeler nation everybody's gunning for the steelers out here in pittsburgh uh browns minus three and a half yeah i think the browns will be able to to beat the steelers pretty easily um i i think that the browns have one of the best defenses in the league in terms of their pass rushing abilities it's it's insane how how good their um pass pass rush defense is now let's check to see so i do believe yeah so it appears to me that um 
that uh, Nick Chubb is going to be playing in this game. And he's one of my favorite running backs in the league period. And so I think, I think with that being the fact that he's going to get a lot of touches in this game, I feel like the, um, the Browns could definitely win. And so with that three and a half, I don't have a problem with it. I think the Browns could, could cover the spread of three and a half. So I'm going to take the Browns right here. Great defense. Uh, I don't trust big Ben in this, in this uh, type of game. So we'll go, we'll go with the, with the Browns right there to cover the spread. Now 49ers bears. I already know this is going to be a bad spread. Let's see the damage 49ers minus four. Oh, wow. Yeah. 49ers have really uh, kind of disappointed this year. 0 oh, 3 at home. That's never good to see. 29th in takeaway differential. That's really not good whatsoever. Rush defense, not good at all. Good against the pass, but there's a lot of injured players. Yikes. Nick Bosa, probably their one of their best, if not the best pass rusher that they have on that defensive line, probable for this game, which is always a good sign for them. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to take the, um, the, uh, the bears in this game. Uh, And that's kind of, I just think this is one of those games where the defensive line of the, um, of the San Francisco 49ers with Nick Bosa possibly coming up, playing in this game off an injury, I feel like their their defensive line and the pressure that they will be able to put on Justin Fields won't be as great as some of the other teams, specifically the Browns. When the Browns played the Bears earlier this year, I feel as though like this is one of those games where you have to kind of watch watch the defensive line and kind of that defense and how they pressure uh this uh, young quarterback in Justin Fields. And so I think the Bears will be able to cover. I don't think they'll win, but I think they'll be able to cover in this game because I think you give uh, Justin Fields some time to throw and he'll be relatively okay. I'm not saying they're going to win the game. I think they'll be able to cover though. So now moving on to the four o'clock window, we have Jags at Seahawks. This will be a really interesting game. Obviously, Russell Wilson out uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, now, this game, I feel like it could, it could, it could be pretty bad for the Seahawks. The Seahawks, from what I've seen, really have not performed well, and I know that because I've watched a bunch of their games, and I also have Tyler Loggett on my fantasy team, and he's really, he's really kind of stunk. And that's kind of my thought about this kind of come my kind of thought about the Seahawks going forward. I really don't trust their latest addition at quarterback Geno Smith. I think that they're kind of an overrated team. And a lot of people have been coming out to kind of say that Pete Carroll should retire. Now I don't really necessarily buy that. Um, But I do think that they are definitely in trouble. And so as a result of that, I would, I would still take the uh, still take the Jaguars here. I don't know if I mentioned that prior before I went into an explanation, but I feel like the Jaguars, and I feel like this is one of those games where Jacksonville they have their quarterback that they've wanted. Uh, Jamal Adams. This is news to me. Jamal Adams is out, so that uh, kind of means less pressure on on a young quarterback, which is always good. And I do feel like this is one of those games where Trevor Lawrence can kind of come out and show out and specifically not going up against Russell Wilson. I feel like this is, this is a game where, yeah, I think the Seahawks have a bye week next week. So I think this is one of those games where they just kind of throw it away. They're like, all right, let's just get to the bye week. And at the end of the game, it's going to be the Jags out on top. I'm going to take the, the Jags against the spread. Uh, I think it'll be a close game though. I think the Jags come out on top. So now moving on to our second four o'clock game, uh, Patriots chargers, Patriots chargers. I'm trying to click on it. Patriots chargers. Definitely, definitely interesting game right here. Chargers are currently minus five and a half. 
I think the Patriots are going to be able to make a game out of this. I think Mac Jones has been really solid this year. He's been pretty much just as good as advertised. And as a result of that, I have to go with the, um, with the Patriots to cover here. I think the Chargers will be able to squeak out a win, but I think the Patriots will be able to cover the spread right here. Justin Herbert's been relatively good this year. He's been, he's been pretty solid. Uh, but I just think that Belichick will be able to put up a defensive game plan to kind of, kind of, to kind of get him over. And also that defense that, that the Patriots have is, is very, very evenly balanced. They don't have a bunch of star players. They traded away Stefan Gilmore. Uh, so maybe that's kind of the next man up mentality. Uh, but with that being said, I do think the Patriots will be able to cover this game. It'll be a close game. And I, I don't trust the, um, the uh, secondary, even though the defensive pass yards per game is fourth for the Chargers, I still don't trust it. Um, and as a result of that, I, I, I do feel the Patriots will be able to cover. Belichick's going to find a way, man. He's going to find a way. So now going on to our next game, Patriots covering, like I said. Uh, Buccaneers, Saints, I think this will be a blowout. Yeah, Buccaneers minus five and a high, five and a half. Give that to me. I really think Buccaneers do have a chance to kind of repeat this year. Uh, Tom Brady's played really well, already 21 touchdowns. He's been pretty much flawless throughout this part of the season. Uh, and then Jameis Winston really hasn't been that bad either. He's kind of been able to fill in the role of Drew Brees relatively well. And I mean, if you're looking at this right now, uh, Brady has thrown pretty much more than double than Jameis Winston, which is kind of crazy. But I mean, you look at, you look at kind of um, the structure of these two teams. I think Brady will be under duress, uh, obviously with that defensive line uh, of the, um, of the saints, I think he'll be able, they'll be able to specifically cam Jordan will be able to get some pressure on him, but without Marshawn Lattimore as questionable, that's kind of a worry for me. Tom Brady also questionable, but I expect him to play in this game. If he doesn't though, give me the saints and Jameis Winston. But if he does play, I think it's a pretty close to a blowout. And now moving on to our, yeah, this is our last, uh, last, uh, Sunday, four o'clock window game uh washington versus denver let's kind of see what this what this line is at broncos minus three washington really hasn't been playing that well T taylor heineke has been kind of been kind of doing pretty well but i would also say that their defense has been really lacking like let's kind of go down here and see what the, the defensive ranks are we thought that this was one of the best D lines in the NFL, if not the best D line in the NFL, but they really haven't been able to, to perform super well. Not yeah, th That's a big in injury with uh, Brandon Scherf and Landon Collins being questionable. Also Curtis Samuel on IR. That doesn't help either. <sighs> but for this game, I, I kind of have to go with Denver Denver is uh, three and four versus the spread compared to one, one and six for Washington. So I'm going to take Denver with the spread. I think they'll be able to cover that three points. And I think that's the end of our um, four o'clock window. Now let's go to the primetime game Sunday night. I'll definitely be watching this instead of going out trick or treating in the cold streets of uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, is it going to let me click? Here we go. Yeah, so Cowboys minus one and a half. This is a game, Dak Prescott, I believe he's a little banged up, but I think he is playing in this game. Yeah, he's not on the injury or anything like that. I think Minnesota, however, is going to be able. Now, the thing that, that makes me that makes me nervous is Dallas is 6-0 and versus the spread. But the thing is, Kirk Cousins hasn't been playing bad this year. I mean, you look at his numbers, that's, oh, that's, yeah, almost 1,800 yards, 13 touchdowns. Justin Jefferson's been playing pretty well. Only three touchdowns, though. 
Uh, Dalvin Cook, if he does play in this game, I think that's a huge help for them. He's been kind of out for the majority of the season. So I would say that the Cowboys, their 6-0 and record against, uh, against the spread is over, and I think the Vikings take this game and they win it. It is uh, at U.S. Bank Stadium, too, just to kind of – put that out there and then our last preview is the giants chiefs um i actually think this will be a relatively competitive game chiefs have kind of not been able to have that statement when they've been been kind of kind of lacking a little bit uh with um patrick mahomes and specifically that defense i do think the um giants will be able to put some points up but I don't think it'll be enough for them to win this game. Uh, however, Chiefs at minus 10, I don't buy it. I do not buy it with how they've been playing recently. I'm going to take the the Giants here with the spread. I do worry about them not having Saquon, even though when they did have Saquon, he has been playing good for them. And now you kind of look at Frank Clark, their DN questionable. Tyreek Hill probable. That always helps for them. And so I would definitely say that uh, they'll be able to cover. The Giants will be able to. Uh, but with that being said, I got to take the um, the Chiefs to win this game, but the Giants to cover. So that, that'll be the uh, conclusion of kind of of that as I'm switching back over to the uh, camera. I really don't know if you're able to see me on a camera when we are doing um, – the the screen sharing thing i really don't know i hope you can i do hope you can see me but now there's something i kind of want to switch gears and kind of go to something else which i'm super excited for super happy for and that's astronomy and you're like astronomy who cares uh, one of the things, if if you know me, and one of the things that I'm super, super passionate about and I'm really interested in is astronomy and space travel, uh, pictures, and all this other kind of stuff, uh, exploration of space. If you know me, you know that I have a real passion about that. And so one of the things I've been most excited for in my adult life is this this telescope that's going out into space. It's called the James Webb Telescope. And so kind of what this whole thing about the James Webb telescope is, it's basically going to be the next Hubble Space Telescope. Now, if you know a lot or if you don't know anything about astronomy, uh, most people would know about the Hubble telescope. It's named after Edwin Hubble, famous astronomer, and it takes pictures. It, it orbits around the Earth about less than, less than 400 miles above the Earth's surface. And it takes really good pictures. It's, it's the biggest um, uh, interplanetary and kind of far out picture taker that we have currently in space right now. And so kind of the idea of the Webb, James Webb Space Telescope is to kind of be the upgrade to that. And so I just kind of wanted to talk about that. That's going to be launching soon. I believe it's December. It's going to be launching in December, and it's been a thing that has been going on for before I was born. They kind of came up with the idea uh, to ha- build something uh, with a with a relatively small budget that would have a mirror that is much bigger and much more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. And so, what a mirror does in a in a telescope specifically in space is, and here on earth as well, but for this purposes, we'll talk in space. It just gives more area for the light that is coming in to reflect off of into the viewfinder and to bounce off another mirror into whatever object you're using to gather your information on, on certain things. Like if you're looking at a planet from far away, if you have a mirror that's that's one foot by one foot that'll only capture as much light as is able to hit that mirror. Whereas if you have a 10 by 10 foot mirror, you'll be able to capture more light. And so you'll be able to get a better picture. And so that's kind of the idea of why we have such huge giant um, 
telescopes not only here on Earth, but also in space. And that's kind of the idea of the James Webb Space Telescope is to get a giant mirror and a giant telescope up into space. And so I just kind of wanted to talk about it because this is something that is when it does launch and when it's in effect, I think it'll change so much about astronomy and so much about what we know. And so I kind of wanted to talk about kind of the, um, what the James Webb Telescope's main focus is and kind of, I'll show pictures and, and certain things like that. So kind of the main thing is that it's a telescope that's going to look super far back in the history of the universe as we know it. So it'll look back super, super far at early galaxies and seeking the light, as it says on NASA's website, seeking the light from the first galaxies in the universe. And then also what it will be doing is exploring distant worlds and our own solar system. So what, so kind of to go off on that first point and what I'll do is I'll actually share my screen for a little bit and show this, this image right here. And now if you look kind of here, this kind of shows you the, um, this image right here, it shows you where uh, the kind of limit and what we'll be looking back for in terms of with the James Webb Space Telescope. So you kind of see Webb's limit versus Hubble's limit. And, and if you look down here at the bottom, you see visible light, near infrared, mid infrared, far infrared, and microwave. So I just wanted to kind of show that picture. So kind of what the idea of the James Webb Space Telescope is, is to look back really far, but also to look back in specifically the infrared range and near and far infrared. And the reason for that, specifically when we're looking at things that are super far away is this idea of redshift, which is the idea that as the universe expands, it expands at a certain rate. And so things that are further away from us, the, the further they are away from us, the faster they're going away from us. So probably the easiest way to explain this, uh, this idea of redshifting is uh, an ambulance that has its siren on that's coming towards you where it's more high pitched as it comes towards you and as it passes by you, the sound of it gets more low pitched. And the reason for that is that as it's coming towards you, the sound waves are getting more packed together as they're coming towards you. Whereas when they pass you, they're kind of stretching out a little bit more as they come towards you from this way, as, being, as opposed to being compressed when they come to you because it's moving, the uh, vehicle is moving towards you. Therefore, the sound waves are being pushed in one direction more so than when the vehicle is moving away from you and they're being kind of stretched out. So that same kind of thing happens to pretty much everything in our universe uh, that is substantially far away from us. We're talking millions and billions of light years away. And so with the James Webb Space Telescope, we'll be able to see and this is the reason why they not really primarily focused on the visible light spectrum. Because if you see something that is millions and billions of light years away, because of the redshift, if you look at it, it'll be so redshifted from visible light, like if it was green, or if it was on the complete left side, like if it was blue, of the visible light spectrum. So it has a really sh shorter wavelength of light than the red where it's, it's a longer wavelength of light. That, that thing that you're actually looking at will be towards the red because the light waves of, it, of the object moving away from you will become so red shifted because it's moving away so much away from you. So kind of the um, think about the the example that I brought up and how it's moving away. So it's in terms of sound, it sounds lower. And that's because the sound waves are being stretched out to say, and so they're longer wavelengths. The same thing happens with light. And we're talking about on a massive scale, on the scale of the entire universe. And so it's really interesting. And that's kind of the reason why they decided to try and use 
infrared light because infrared light, it kind of measures the heat of objects. One of the really cool things that they said to kind of put it into perspective is that if the James Webb Space Telescope was on Earth, you could detect the heat signature of a, uh, which means the, uh, the heat that is coming off of, or the heat that is being generated or projected of a bumblebee on the surface of the moon. Now the moon is a couple hundred thousand miles away and that's really small. A bumblebee is really small. And to be able to take that level of smallness, should I say, from that distance is something that we have not really seen too much of in our modern astronomical times. And so it's something that is extremely important to astronomy. But I also want to touch on not just it looking so far back in time, we're talking millions and billions of years ago, pretty much right up to the Big Bang. Like in the picture I showed you, it'll be looking back towards where the first galaxies were being formed. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of years after the Big Bang happened. And we'll be looking at kind of the birth of what eventually becomes more so what our galaxy is now. And we're talking billions of years later, millions of years later to where our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy is right now, we'll be looking back in time. And another reason why they use infrared is because when you're looking back so far in time, there's things in the way. It's not just there's a single straight path that you look through, there's galaxies that are going to be in your way. If you point it in any which way, you're going to hit a galaxy pretty much anywhere you look. And so the idea of the infrared is to be able to look through those galaxies to kind of see so far back and to catch so much of that early universe light and kind of see what you can kind of gather from the early universe to kind of extrapolate that information and data out to now where we have kind of present day. So yeah, just to recap, it's, it's the successor to the iconic Hubble Space Telescope. It's going to be Hubble on steroids. And it's um, to kind of talk more about the, um, the telescope. It is, um, it's just a fascinating, fascinating piece of technology. I mean, it's been it's been um, in uh, production and kind of thought about for, it's been thought about pretty much after they released the Hubble. They were like, this Hubble thing is crazy. Like we're able to see cool things, but let's do more. Let's go further. And so that's kind of where the idea of the James Webb Space Telescope came. And the reason why it is named James Webb is because during from 1961 to 1968, through much of the um, Apollo program, Apollo was started in 1961. Um, much of that program was headed by this guy named James Webb, who previously to being the, um, the kind of big guy on campus for, for NASA program, he was a attorney and a businessman. And uh, at the time, Kennedy, the president at the time, came to him and he said, hey, I want you to be be my NASA guy. I want you to run the space program. I want to go to the moon. I want to, I want to travel outside of the, the Earth's atmosphere. I want to go to space. And James Webb was like, nay, why not? And so under James Webb's tutelage, the Apollo program started. Uh, and it was kind of run through up until 1968. And 1968, late that year, uh, they did start the first crewed flight of Apollo, which would be Apollo 1. And so, but a lot of the work beforehand was done by James Webb. And so it's such a pivotal piece, especially going up against the Soviets in Russia and the Soviet Union uh, and the space race and all that kind of stuff. So there was a huge impact that James Webb had on the United States uh, space program. And so that's kind of what this project has been named after for, because some people, uh, they don't know. 
if you search up James Webb, it'll show up the, the telescope or it'll show up. Um, there's a baseball player that I saw. Uh, there's a bunch of people named James Webb, apparently. And so just uh, just kind of cool. And then also to kind of talk about the the flight itself. Well, first, let me do let me show you this screen that I'm looking at right now for some for some quick facts. So this is a this is a cool screen or cool graphic, I should say. So just kind of to look at the size of the um, the object itself. So it has 18 individual mirror segments. And now if you look back down here, kind of towards the beryllium marker, that's, that's, um, that's what the uh, mirrors are individually made out of. So they're made out of a, a thin layer of gold, about 700 atoms thick. And so that is many times smaller than a, a human hair. It is insanely, insanely small. And then also the size of the entire, the entire thing, as you can see up here, is about the size of a, of a full-size tennis court. Then you can um, see this down here, uh, the materials and the temperature range. I'm going to touch on that soon. Kind of see how many... Um, countries and, and people have worked on this project to kind of put this together. Uh, and then kind of fun facts. Yeah, as I said before, uh, theoretically detect a heat signal bumblebee at the distance of the moon if you're from Earth. And yeah, and this next part here, the sun shield, that's what I kind of want to go into next. So I'm going to stop the share there for a second. And the sun shield is one of the biggest things of this project. And the reason for that is because, as I mentioned earlier, the bulk of what this telescope will be looking at is in the infrared. And so infrared basically is just the heat signature. Not basically, but one of the things that it does is it sees the heat signature of objects and stuff like that. If you have an infrared infrared light or something like that you're you kind of see um the the heat signature of things here on earth so if yeah if you go out and you buy a heat an infrared camera or something like that you're able to see the um the uh, heat signatures here on earth and that's really important in terms of the cooling and why i said the sun shield on this specific device on this specific space telescope is basically equivalent to an SPF of about 1 million. Uh, I like to go out when I use sunscreen. I like to use it a lot. I like a lot. I don't like to get burnt. I'm very pale, as you can see. Um, I like to use like 30 to 50. That's kind of my range. I'm not using a million. I'm not there just yet. However, the reason why this James Webb has to have uh, that level of protection from the sun is when you're in the vacuum of space, there is no atmosphere. There's, there's nothing to block the heat energy of the sun. Whereas here we have the atmosphere miles and miles thick that helps protect us from the dangerous rays and the dangerous heat from the sun. And so it'll be able to keep the telescope at a reasonable temp on the side that is going to be looking at certain stars and certain things like that. So at all times of the day, it'll be pointed away from the sun. It'll have kind of its back to the sun and have the, the, the um, apparatus that it uses to, to see out of pretty much pointed at wherever it needs to go. And so like I said, the reason for that is if there's any any external heat that is going to be uh, forced onto the uh, camera or any of the mirrors or anything like that, that will actually show up in the image that is being taken by the James Webb. And so you definitely don't want that. You want it to be pretty much as cold as possible. And so what the um, people kind of did was, uh, and I'll actually go back to um, screen share right here so you can kind of see see it right here 
Uh, so they have one, two, three, four, five layers of sun shields. And so on the outer layer, it's going to be 125 degrees Celsius, 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And then once it hits this final layer, it'll be cooled down to about negative 235 degrees Celsius or almost negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So the operating temperature will be around 60 Kelvin or negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. And like I said, that is to keep it from overheating. And so I, I think it's, it's extremely, extremely important to, let me put it back on myself for a second, extremely important to kind of understand the, the science that goes into it. So, and then also the mechanics when it goes up, when it's launched into space, it's going to unfold. And out of the, um, the payload section of the rocket, it's going to unfold. It's going to have these big giant mirrors come out. And then underneath it is, it's going to kind of stretch out on the bottom. And then the sun shields are going to come out, fill up, and then they're going to be tensed. So they're super tight so that they can protect the, um, the camera apparatus from the heat of the sun. So this is just an incredibly, incredibly super complex uh, thing that is going to be going on from the, um, from the satellite itself. And I'm just looking at this thing right here. This is the next thing that I kind of wanted to show right here this is actually where the um this is a perfect illustration on where the actual telescope will be so what is going on right here in this image right over here where you have major deployments so you obviously have the sun and then you have the earth so this will be actually orbiting the earth about a million miles away and how that's possible is it's going to be at this spot in space called the Lagrange two point. There's multiple Lagrange points, and that's just the term for how it will orbit around the earth. And so this will be at Lagrange point two, approximately 1 million miles away from the earth. And as you can see, the solar array deployment communications deployed, sun shield deployed, mirror deployed, and so on and so forth. And then it'll kind of be out around in this orbit, right around there, kind of being influenced by the, by the gravity of Earth. And so I just wanted to kind of point that out to see it's going to be really far out there. Earlier, I mentioned that the Hubble Space Telescope is less than 400 miles away from Earth. And the James Webb is going to be a million miles outside of Earth, traveling in this circular motion kind of thing on a path that is Earth right here. And then James Webb is going to be like this as the Earth orbits around the sun. You got the James Webb kind of in that kind of motion. So it's not going to be Earth in the center and James Webb like this. It's going to be James Webb like that with the Earth and stuff. It's crazy. I don't know how they figured this out. Not that good with this stuff. But so to kind of to kind of get them to there, uh, they're going to be using a rocket. And the rocket is called the Ariane 5. I'll actually show a a picture of it right here. Once again, I'm showing lots of screen shares, just, just so you guys can see it. And if you're listening on the, um, on audio version, I, I apologize. You can always watch on YouTube and stuff like that, but kind of what the Ariane five rocket is, it is a European rocket. And if you're looking at the picture, it has two boosters at the bottom with a nozzle in between them, which is the best way to kind of describe it. And it's done over a hundred uh, missions to orbit. Uh, I'm not sure if it's ever been to, to um, a location kind of as far away as um, 1 million miles outside of earth. So this will be an interesting one in my, in my mind. So it's, it's a 
multi-stage rocket with a combination of solid and cryogenic liquid propellant. And so kind of what I've really um, done here, if you look here, it's like all, all kind of the steps of what it's going to be doing. And so the main thing to kind of understand this, so in terms of thrust of the engines being on and it pushing the um, James Webb Space Telescope into, into orbit and where it's going to be placed, that's going to be 27 minutes long. So it's uh, in the frame of things, it's going to be a relatively long launch and the engines are going to be on for a pretty long time. So 27 minutes total of the thrust, and then it'll be approximately around 30 minutes before the James Webb Space Telescope is actually released. And then at that point, it'll be the sun shield being deployed, all those other things that I had shown earlier where you have the certain um, things being deployed. Then you have the, the kind of upper stage where it's a much smaller, it's not, it's not necessarily the rocket, it's a much smaller um, engine being, um, being able to propel the um, space telescope to where its final destination will be at the Lagrange point too. And so kind of, I guess one of the big things about this project is what's the cost? How much is this thing cost? Like I mentioned, this thing kind of got thought of right after the Hubble Space Telescope was in space for a number of years. At that point, they were, and I've been listening to a bunch of things on this, the motto at NASA at the time was uh, pretty much make the best stuff you got, but do it cheap. And the original kind of figure for what they wanted the uh, entire um, James Webb uh, telescope process to be was about around the figure of $500 million. Now, this is back in the 1990s. So today, with inflation and everything like that, that'd be almost a billion dollars. Um, but now, 24 years after, uh, the total figure stands at 10.8 billion dollars as of 2020 and the most amount of investment in terms of dollars that was put into this project was in 2014 with 658 million dollars put into the project that includes pretty much everything that has anything to do with James Webb like everything from transportation to to I would assume paying people's salary to the the fuel the tests that needed to be done there was these really cool tests where they would put james webb in these rooms and they would blast music at them with these giant subwoofers to to kind of see if the components of the james webb space telescope would stand up to being in a launch with these huge giant rockets just going off and spraying everywhere and then there was also things where they would measure to see how it would go up against the cold and the vacuum of space to see how the components would work, how it would unfold and all this other kind of stuff. And so it was definitely a lot more expensive than they thought it would be. Some people would argue that it was better. It would have been better for them to spend their money to get it out into space sooner. But there was, there was definitely a lot of hiccups along the way, government shutdowns obviously with COVID and everything like that, that definitely slowed things down for a while, but they're still on task to release in um, December. And I am super, super excited to see what it'll actually do. And so in December, it'll launch and then pretty much it will go into operation about six months after the official launch here in December of this year. And then also kind of the sad thing, or the thing that I think is kind of sad about this, is that it's only going to be around for a few years. And I really couldn't understand why they're going to be doing, uh, they say five to 10 years for this. Uh, it says the, the actual duration of the mission. So when it is in space, looking at other things will be five to 10 years. And so I thought that that was short because I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope has been going for 
20 plus years probably. So maybe it goes for longer. I really don't know to spend close to $11 billion on this project and only have it in observing and looking at space and looking at the early universe, looking at exoplanets and seeing kind of what their atmosphere is like, see if there's signs of life there, looking at our own solar system, looking at Jupiter, seeing what the atmosphere of Jupiter is made up of, seeing the rings of Jupiter, seeing the rings of Saturn, seeing the rings of Uranus, all these different places that if you use the infrared spectrum, you can see the rings of Jupiter. We can't see it with the visible light spectrum. It's just, it's not possible. You can see it with Saturn, but you can't see it. That's some science that I don't quite understand. I do know that to be true though. You can't really see the, uh, the rings of Jupiter or Uranus for that matter with like the naked eye kind of thing with visible light. You can see it with infrared for whatever reason. But I would kind of say to kind of put this, put this into kind of perspective, this is going to be one of the premier, premier science things of my life. This is going to be one of those things that is put up into space. I'm 23 years old. This will probably be over by the time I'm 30. Uh, maybe maybe a little into my 30s. And I, I remember being in college. And at that time, I was really interested in astronomy, really interested in going places in our own solar system. For example, when we landed on Mars a couple years back, my senior year, I believe last year in 2020, maybe even early 2021, but I think I want to say it was 2020 when they landed the rover on Mars, the one that had the helicopter attached to it. That was one of the, the coolest moments of my life because it, it's because of, it's kind of like my fascination with sports, sports, the people that you see on NFL field or on a basketball court they are there not because they were they were just their names were drawn out of a hat it is because from the time they were born in most cases they worked their butts off every single day and it took some people two decades if they're in their 20s when they get drafted or whatever 20 years of work put into so they can get on that field so they could score that touchdown or or make that game winning bucket or win that championship, whatever it is. And I kind of feel the same way with space travel. These people work for 20 years. Some of these people, they die before the project is done. I think that's what happened with the person who um, discovered Pluto. He definitely wasn't around by the time, or people who discovered many of the planets, they're not around by the time when we send a probe millions and millions of miles away to these planets to take actual pictures of. They're not around to see that. And for somebody to pick up where that last person left off and to finish the research that they're doing and to see these things kind of end up and go, go on into the future, that's one of the things that I think is the coolest thing about astronomy. It's these decades and decades of work that is put into these projects where some of the biggest questions about are we alone in this universe? Is there other life out there? What are these other places in our solar system? Is this the only sun that has a planet in the habitable zone where there's life on it? Is this the only way that life comes about where you have humans and then different kind of mammals, reptiles, all these different things. Is water what, what made humans or was it something else? What made humans, especially, especially with the extinction of the dinosaurs and the event that happened that wiped them out? Why after that did humans evolve from apes? What These certain types of questions and whether they can be applied throughout the universe. If there's only one way of ending up kind of 
where we are, where you have somebody in a, in a um, apartment, in a city, in the middle of the country, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, doing a podcast, sitting around talking about it with as much passion, as much love of it as I do. Is that happening somewhere else in the universe? And we just haven't been able to find that out yet. If we sent a message to somebody who's a million light years away, seeing the Andromeda galaxy, they're not going to know for a million years because theoretically nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So if we send out a radio message to them, they're not going to get it for a million years in the Andromeda galaxy. Even in our own Milky Way galaxy, if you send a message out, it's not going to reach somebody for decades, decades, even if you do reach them. And so all this stuff with astronomy and stuff like that, it gives me a lot of hope because it, it might be able to prove that specifically with James Webb, what the early universe was like. How did the first galaxies form after the Big Bang? What happened when the universe was cooling after it heated up after that huge explosion? What was, what was the early formation of the planets like? What exoplanets are out there? What are, the, what are their atmospheres made of? Is there life out there? These are questions that I that I'm so excited to not find out, but get more knowledge in with the James Webb Space Telescope. Because we found over 3,000 exoplanets currently right now. But the thing is, I want to go further. I want to know more. There was, there was a time in my senior year when they, they came out and they said that there was life on Venus. And I was super excited. And they later came out to say, no, it was just something in the atmosphere that's left over from whatever. But the excitement was there, was we're not alone. And that's, that's a huge question of, are we alone? And do you want to be alone? And if there is life, do you want to know that it exists? And a lot of people have kind of been going back and forth on this. My thought is, I want there to be other life. I don't want to be alone in the universe. I want there to be, because the universe is massive. First off, I don't think we'll ever be able to know if a galaxy or a planet millions and billions of light years away hasn't done everything that we've done here, everything from all the experience that you or I have ever experienced, but just so far away that we can't, we can never know. Maybe there's somebody having this exact podcast, exact conversation, 10 million light years away from me right now. And they're, and to my perspective, 10 million years in the past from where earth is right now. Maybe that's already happened and those civilizations and those planets have already gone through their end and their demise. That's what I want to know. I want to know if we're alone. I want to know if this is the only way that life can persist with water and oxygen and, and hydrogen being combined together. And then you have the evolution of animals from the beginning of time, millions of years ago here on earth to now where you have this guy talking to you on a microphone that somebody built on a computer that somebody built that came out of their mind. Is that happening somewhere else? And I guess that kind of to, to kind of bring this to a close is that's kind of my fascination with specifically with James Webb, because it'll not only be looking into the future, I mean, looking into the past, but it will also be looking possibly into the future where you see in the past, early galaxies forming, certain really, really far uh, star systems and things of that nature, but also to the future where you see um, exoplanets and you see what's in their atmosphere and if there's signs of life there and what that means for the future of, we're not alone here. There's other life forms out there and I feel like that'll be a rejoice to some people, especially if, if, if the UFOs, if these unidentified flying objects are, gives more credibility, not to them, because there's definitely evidence that there's UFOs, but is, is there evidence that these UFOs are being driven 
by drones here on Earth, or is it from an alien civilization? Maybe to some people that's super scary, but to me, I want to know if there's other life out there. And if it's confirmed that there is, that's awesome. That's awesome. That means that we're not the only one where it worked out, where we got formed and, and all of the supernova explosion and all the things that elements and materials and atoms and molecules that came out of that created me and everything that I'm, that I'm literally sitting in this chair, the computer I'm using, the battery that's in the, the lithium ions, everything that was created out of stardust. That's what I'm interested in. That's what I want to know. And that's why I'm so excited about the James Webb Space Telescope. Maybe I'll talk about it next time on the podcast, but I just wanted to come out and kind of give my thoughts on the James Webb Space Telescope. And there's so much that I'm missing with it in terms of the, the mirrors and the kind of imagery that it's using and the technology, cameras, all this other stuff that's on it. But that's not my expertise. My expertise is, is more so on just like the general base stuff that I've kind of learned. And so just to kind of close this out, be sure to reach out and watch it watch this event when it gets launched because it'll be a huge day in the history if everything goes smoothly it'll be awesome it'll be completely awesome and so moving on to the next topic though uh, i do want to talk about this other thing to like kind of like completely turn around and switch gears i've been talking for a while let me get a drink of water Excuse me. I do want to talk about this performance enhancing drugs in the fitness industry. Recently, I've been going to the gym a lot and I've been taking my, my fitness, my diet a lot more seriously than I have in the past. To some who may not know, I was diagnosed with a thyroid condition called Hashimoto's. And it's an autoimmune disease, and it's a disease in which my thyroid basically attacks itself, and it destroys itself. So if you were to take a, uh, I think it's an ultrasound of my thyroid, there's little holes in it because of my body attacking it. So I have to take this medicine for it. And um, if I don't take the medicine, it kind of impairs a lot of the bodily functions that I do. And I've had a lot of issues with uh, my vitamin D levels kind of my bone density and certain things like that. So as a result of that, I've been taking my health more seriously. I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm an addict or, or, I'm, or I'm counting every single calorie that I take. I'm not perfect at it whatsoever. Uh, and I'm also not trying to be a bodybuilder either. But um, I've been following a lot of people on, on TikTok and doing and listening to these people who are in the bodybuilding strong men, uh, just overall fitness industry and kind of give their thoughts about them taking certain products, whether it's anabolic steroids, SARMs, Tren, uh, whatever it is, D-ball, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is kind of this argument over whether or not taking steroids is a, a cheat in a way, to getting a good physique. And I kind of wanted to kind of bring my thoughts out on that because this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. And I think I've kind of come up with kind of my current statement on it right now. Not that anybody's asked, but it's just something that I wanted to kind of reach out and kind of say. Um, well, the first thing is for people who, on the one hand, they do steroids, they do performance enhancing drugs, I should say, PEDs. They do PEDs, but then they go on, if somebody were to ask them or if they just blatantly say on, on social media or on whatever platform that they're an addy or they're natural. That's a line where I feel like is completely not okay. Uh, because one, you're misleading your audience. If you have a great physique and you're working out and and you have a following and you say to your following, I'm natural, 
I didn't use any steroids or any PEDs or anything like that. You can be just like me. That gives a false sense of hope for these people such as myself who was like, whoa, if he can look like that without steroids, I don't want to do steroids. I've heard everything that you do with steroids is bad for you. They'll kill you. Uh, all the bodybuilders I see, they always die young from steroids. So if I can get a body like this dude and he doesn't do steroids, that gives me so much hope. On the one hand, you give hope to people, but on the other hand, it's false hope. And that's kind of the point that I'm getting at. It's, it's not reality. Some of these people who say that they're natural, that they're, they only do vegan, they only take protein powder or whatever, and have these insanely crazy bodies, and they're lying to people. That's where I say it's not right. And so this brings me to kind of the second piece of my thoughts on this issue. In terms of bodybuilding, uh, more specifically bodybuilding than the kind of the strongman kind of thing. When it comes to bodybuilding and trying to get as big and as good looking as possible in terms of maximizing the amount of muscle that you have on your body, when it comes to performing performance enhancing drugs, I don't have a problem with it. I think that it's, if it's important to you to look your absolute best, then it shouldn't be a problem whatsoever to do everything that you can to look your absolute best. And every single body has a potential of what it can look like from genetics to also how much work you put in. There is a, a, a body potential that you do have that can be kind of ex not exploited, but kind of filled out by the amount of exercise and weightlifting that you do and the amount of muscle that you can put on your body. And I think by using performance enhancing drugs to get to that area isn't a problem unless your focus is to, like I said before, stay natural and not use any performance enhancing drugs. A lot of people will hit a wall where their body is like, this is the amount that I can do. And the only way to surpass that point is to use these performance enhancing drugs. And I'm not a doctor. I'm not advising to, to do anything. I'm just saying for those people that do use it, I don't have a problem with it unless they are saying that they aren't using it and they're blatantly lying to people and saying that they don't use anything. Meanwhile, they'd use everything in the book. That's where I draw the line. And kind of to go forward, kind of how I think of fitness and bodybuilding is to kind of reach the body's potential and to try and sort of pretty much get as big as possible, Just specifically for bodybuilding, get the most amount of muscle that you can. And I think a lot of that is aided by using performance enhancing drug for some people, other people, they have a sense of pride of being able to be like, I created this physique and I look just as good as anybody else. And I did it without having to use steroids while these other people cut corners using steroids. And why I put quotations around that is because if you do use steroids or you do use any kind of performance enhancing drug, you still have to put the work in, right? But it's just the results that you get out of it are different. And I would say, yeah, kind of bodybuilding is the sport of filling out your body with the most amount of muscle mass that your body can absolutely take, putting it to the limit. My favorite example is Ronnie Coleman. Ronnie Coleman, if you look at him, when he was in his heyday, when he was winning Olympia after Olympia after Olympia, he had so much muscle on his body. And I, can, I can't believe that he wasn't using any performance enhancing drugs of any kind, whether that's anabolic steroids that he would inject himself, anything. To say that, that he used performance enhancing drugs and, that, and that's the reason why he got that big or because he used performance enhancing drugs, his career doesn't mean anything. That's a flat out lie. I think what Ronnie Coleman did was he took his body and basically the human body to that effect and took it to the, to the 10th level. He was in the top gear 
full RPM, 8,000 RPMs every single, every single year, going balls to the wall as hard as he could. And as a result of that, now you look at him now, he's pretty much had his entire back fused. All of his discs are completely destroyed by his years of punishing his body and going through so much work to put on muscle mass and, and to build a huge and giant body that in his later years, his bones and his ligaments and tendons have kind of broken down and kind of failed on him. And it's really, in some ways it's sad to see, but in other ways it's, it's like he gave everything that he had. He reached his full potential. I don't think Ronnie Coleman, if you asked him, did he reach his potential in the bodybuilding industry? Is there things that he felt like he left on the table? Maybe he could have eaten better. I, I, I honestly don't know. But I think that's one of the people that you look like. And there's countless other examples of people who put their body to the potential. But I use that example because he's, he's the first person that I ever heard of in terms of bodybuilding, in terms of any of that stuff. I remember watching a video of him with, he might have had, 25 30 plates on a leg press and he was just repping it like it was nothing and he had these big wraps on his knees and he just said yeah buddy lightweight and then boom he went right into it and that's when i was like oh these guys are built different these guys are built different and i kind of now looking back on that i think that's awesome i i don't really see there's definitely issues where you have somebody who is so focused on this one goal and they're so motivated that they're not thinking about the long-term consequences, but in the moment, it is so good. The glory is so good to be able to go up on that stage and win however many Olympias to be that number one guy, to be one of the greatest of all time. You have to give some things up. And I believe if you ask Ronnie Coleman, is he happy about his life and the choices that he made to get into bodybuilding? I would think he would say, yeah. And a lot of it is genetics. And um, a lot of it is hard work as well. And I would assume some of it, or maybe a lot of it is even performance enhancing drugs. And it's just a really interesting argument to kind of have. Because on the one hand, going into competition, there is the argument that they want everybody to be on a level playing field where nobody is using any performance enhancing drugs whatsoever. But I think in today's age where there's so many supplements and different things that people can take outside of the straight anabolic steroid kind of thing where you just inject it like the, the, you look up like uh, steroids and bodybuilders online that's the first thing that you think of is these guys injecting a syringe with steroid or whatever into their body. And so now there's so many more options with that. And I think when you look at kind of this idea or this notion that bodybuilding is tainted or these players are tainted by, by putting this stuff into the, into their body, I would, I would argue, and I can understand the other side, I can argue that they're just reaching their body's full potential. They're going a million miles an hour, and they're just trying to, like I said multiple times, reach their body's potential, trying to get as much muscle mass onto their body, onto their frame as possible. And that's kind of what bodybuilding is. Who can put on the most amount of muscle? Who's the biggest? Who's the strongest? Who's the leanest? Who looks the best? That's what bodybuilding is. Now, it might be a little different, not, not totally different when it comes to strong men, because that's more about your strength. And that's much, much more genetic because some people are just able to lift more heavy weights. Some people are heavier. They're able to put on much more uh, body mass and certain things like that. When they're lifting these huge weights, it's there's a difference if you're 250 pounds and you're 450 pounds and you're lifting a 200 pound uh, 
stone or whatever. There's a huge difference there. And so I think the argument does kind of change for that slightly. I do think they should be able to use performance enhancing drugs, but when you're on uh, the strong men or something like that, I think that, um, not that it should be regulated, but I think the athletes should put out what they are using just so that there, there's open accountability in kind of the, the, the um, things that they're putting into their body. So other competitors, not so that if they lose their other competitors be like, well, he did, he did this PED and I didn't. So that's why I lost. No, I would say a lot of it, and I, I don't know anybody who's a strongman or anything like that, but I would assume there's a good amount of people who do strongmen that are on performance-enhancing drugs that they use them frequently. And I, like I said, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I think for strongmen, as opposed to bodybuilding, you should be more open and honest with what you're using. And I don't think you should be penalized for it. I think it's, it's um, once again, reaching the body's potential. And it's about who's the strongest. And it doesn't matter how you get there. Maybe there should be bonus points for if you're natural, you're completely natural and you're in the strongman competition and you perform well. Maybe there should be bonus points for something like that. But I would say overall, I would say that when it comes to, and then here's also the difference between strongman and bodybuilding. Strongman is just how strong you are. How much can you lift? How much mass can you move? Where bodybuilding, it's more so about how good you look. What do the muscles on your body look like? So I think there's a big difference there in terms of the, the PED usage. That's why I kind of stray away from let them do anything. And, and it doesn't matter what they take. Because at the end of the day, with bodybuilders, it's mostly about how you look, uh, how your muscles look, how your back, your legs, everything looks. Whereas with strongmen, it's more about your performance and you're actually doing these events and say somebody does 30 reps of 300 pounds on bench press and you do 12. That, that's how you win the competition where as opposed to bodybuilding, where it's just pretty much who, who looks better. And so I would say for that one, I'd particularly say it's more important to, um, I, I don't want to get them away from performance enhancing drugs. I would say for them to be more open with it. And now maybe here's something else that could be proposed is that there could be a difference between or different uh, competitions where there's nothing there's nothing bad about um, somebody who's doing a um, competition. And then there's another league where it's completely 100% natural. They're tested uh, all the way leading up to it. They can't do anything. And they're being monitored where other people, where they can do whatever. And in that other league, there, there could be people that are natural as well. It's like anything goes in that other league. But then there's that other league where it's super, super supervised and there's nobody that can, that can do anything. And that's both for strongmen, body, but any competition like that, I think maybe you could do two leagues like that. It would be really, really, really hard to kind of monitor all that so much effort and, and time would have to be dedicated to just watching these guys uh, not use performance enhancing drugs and I think that maybe that's something in the future, but my official stance on performance enhancing drugs in bodybuilding and strongmen and these, these competitions and stuff like that is I say, I don't have a problem with it. I don't, I don't think it makes you a bad person. I don't think it makes you a cheater. I think it's somebody who understands that they're trying to reach their bodies full muscular or strength potential. And I think there are these things that have been created. Some of them are definitely more dangerous than others. No, no doubt about it. But I think specifically, now I'm not talking about basketball or baseball. That's a completely different argument from what I'm making. 
And I frankly haven't, haven't really considered that before doing the show today. I'm strictly talking strong men and bodybuilding and those kind of competitions like that. Those are more so about putting on as much muscle mass as possible or being as strong as possibly. So I would say kind of do what you want, but in terms of the strong men, be extremely open about it. You, you should have to be able to release every single thing that you're taking. I think that would be beneficial and also kind of keep people open and honest. Like there, there are kind of going back to what I was saying earlier with the, um, the people who are natural, uh, there is a level of, let me get a sip of this real quick. There was kind of, uh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Anyways, when it comes to performance enhancing drugs, another thing I wanted to, to kind of bring up is maybe, maybe there's a thing where like a month or a, a year or a week leading out to a competition, whether it's bodybuilding or um, strongman type competitions, maybe like a week before that or a certain period of time before that, they're extremely closely monitored. They have to do tests and everything like that to ensure that they're clean so that everybody's on the same scale and on the same slate going into that uh, event. And I, I, I think that's, I think that's really interesting. And that, that's a cool uh, proposition. Maybe some people aren't for it. Like I said, I think there would be a way to kind of do it where there's a league where there's people who can, anything goes, it doesn't matter what you do, any PED that you want. And then there's the other league where you kind of are like, uh, you have to be clean. There's tests every so often. And you have to be natural and no performance enhancing drugs or anything, just like, just like using protein powder or whatever. So that's kind of my thought on the whole performance enhancing drugs. I watched a uh, TikTok live today of these two people kind of talking about what the fitness industry today is and kind of what it's turned into. And like these guys who are dying young because they're using performance enhancing drugs. And I think Oh, this is what I wanted to, to talk about earlier. Yes. Uh, it is, it's, I would say it's important for the younger generation or people who are hopeful to be in the fitness or bodybuilding or strongman industry is, is to have real education on certain things that these professionals are putting into their body, knowing that the, knowing that certain dosages are, are healthy and having extreme knowledge on what these athletes or these kids who want to, who want to get into bodybuilding, what they're putting into their body. I think that's extremely, extremely important. And that cannot be stressed enough. I think there should be an open dialogue with what these people are putting into their bodies and how to go about it safely. That's the biggest thing. Because if you just say, yeah, I do steroids. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. them. Then the next question is, okay, but how much? Oh, I do 500 milligrams every day. And then some kid who's 150 pounds lighter is like 500 milligrams. Let's do it. Let's go balls to the wall. And then two years later, their liver fails or their kidneys fail or something bad happens to them because they've been going, uh, taking this, thing that isn't um working for their body because they're taking too much of it and then also also there's the uh, thing that some people want to um i apologize i'm getting all these text messages during my podcast come on guys come on you know what it is but to kind of go back i lost i, I keep losing my train of thought i promise I promise I'm not, I'm not too drunk or anything like that. I'm, I'm not feeling anything. It's just, I got so much going on in the background. I got so much stuff flying around my head, man. I, I would just like to say to like, kind of close this out, this particular section, I got more after this, but this particular section, 
PEDs, if done correctly, if done safely, I have no problem with people in bodybuilding or strongmen doing it to improve their performance. As long as they're doing it safely and they're communicating safely to other people, uh, make sure that you're doing it to be safe and to be smart with it. And don't just do something because you hear somebody else do. Make sure that you know, for some people like myself who have an autoimmune deficiency disorder, Hashimoto's disease, or some people who have diabetes, whatever it is, make sure that it'll work for them. And sometimes that means talking to a doctor. And uh, I've been listening to a lot of these people who talk about them going to their doctors and these huge buff guys and their doctors be like, I know you're on, on this certain like testosterone or whatever. Uh, it's, it's killing your body and like, you're going to die soon. And these people disagreeing with their doctor saying, I'm in the best shape of my life. Like I, can I just get like a test to see where my levels are? And the doctor's like, nope, not until you stop doing whatever you're doing. And so I feel like that, that's definitely an issue because your doctor sometimes is there to, well, I think your doctor definitely, let me rephrase that doctor is always there to inform you about your health and stuff like that. But if you were somebody and you wanted to do something with your body to reach your full potential with your body and start doing these, these certain PEDs to go to your doctor and have an open dialogue and be like, Hey, like I want to become a bodybuilder and I want to take this certain PED or this supplement and your doctor is open to it and be like, Hey, like I completely support you wanting to do what you want to do. But unfortunately, because of this uh, supposition that you have or this certain disease that you have, you can't take this supplement, but you can take this instead. And here's how much you should take based on your body weight, based on your health, your age, all this other stuff. I feel like that would be super beneficial to, to certain people. And I think it just takes a lot of trust from not only the doctor, but also from you to trust what the doctor's saying. Because I would assume that these doctors really don't get trained or taught about uh, anabolic steroids or performance enhancing drugs and dosages like that for certain people. So it's definitely a super, super complex issue. But I do think, I do think that um, I'm certainly not, not 100% right in this. I'm sure there's other people who have a difference of opinion and different um, experiences with this industry. I've never done any performance enhancing drugs. I, I think the most I've ever done was protein powder and creatine and pre-workout. That's pretty much the, uh, the level I've also done. Maca powder, I do these um, uh, shakes where uh, I do um, this um, MCT8 oil. I uh, ingest that I take that, I take a scoop of MCT8 oil from, um, it's called Keto Elevate from this company called Biotrust. I take a scoop of that, plop it in. I take a, a teaspoon of maca powder, which um, helps with um, your um, athletic performance uh, and certain other, other aspects and things like that. It's just this little powder from, I don't know, Take a teaspoon of that. Uh, obviously, protein. I use um, whey, uh, the gold standard protein, just one of the really, really general ones. Do do some of that, and then there's also um, uh, it's a collagen that I that I use. Oh, what is it? What's the name of it? Protein, some or something. Protein, something. It's something like that. Uh, that's kind of, it's going to mess me up, but anyways, I take all of that. And I, if I want to do it without fruit, without frozen food, I'll do that. And I'll do it with uh, whole milk just for the extra protein in it. And the little bit of the extra fats, uh, I do that. And I drink that, or sometimes I'll do it with almond milk. If I, if I want to kind of cut down on the calories. So I'll do that. Uh, blend it up in a, in a little, we have a little neutral bullet that I do. And then there's a little attachment that you can put on top of it and you can just drink it straight up like that. And, and then also um, 
sometimes in the morning, I do that same thing, the MCT oil, protein, all that other stuff, do that. But then I add frozen blueberries and frozen strawberries uh, for to kind of get more carbohydrates and kind of stuff like that. Um, and then also if I want to get more calories, like if that's going to be my only meal until a certain time, I'll do that like in the morning kind of thing. Uh, as opposed to having like a, a breakfast or, or something like that, I'll drink that. So I get a lot of protein. I like eggs too and certain things like that, but that's, that's kind of, it's kind of what I like to do. Um, yeah. So to kind of close off the uh, PEDs uh, discussion, don't claim you're natty if, or you're natural, if um, you're taking PEDs, that's lying. Uh, and if you are looking to take PEDs or, or any uh, form of performance enhancers on your bodybuilder or power lifter I, I, or strong men or whatever, I don't have an issue with it. I think you should be able to do what you want. And I think that you shouldn't be condemned for doing something that, that you enjoy, even if it may or may not give you um, bad uh, experience later on in your life. Uh, and then also, I think it should should be made possibly a creation of two leagues, one where it's natural testing like every so often, and the other one where it's just anything goes. And I think maybe that creates a whole different record book as well. But I think that's a it's a it's an interesting conversation to have. And I'd love to have that conversation and kind of hash out ideas and stuff like that, especially if somebody disagrees with me, I'd love to hear the other side because obviously I'm not an expert with this. I'm just a guy with an opinion. And then, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the end to that uh, section now, kind of shifting gears once again, I'm going to uh, kind of bring up and talk about uh, the shirt that I'm wearing. I'm not gonna be able to show the bottom part but if you know anything about comic comedy or something like that, this is Don L. Rawlings. Don L. Rawlings, formerly on the Chappelle Show, comedian, tours with Dave Chappelle a lot, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I actually was able to, I went home recently. This was late June, maybe? Uh, after I had graduated from college, my then fiance at the time uh, got me a gift and she got me tickets to go see my my favorite comedian, Dave Chappelle. He was performing in Connecticut where I would be at the time and it was at a casino and I had, I had only gone to see, I think Jim Gaffigan it was prior to that and so I... I went to the show with my brother and it was a, a really, really good experience. And I, th I want to say the show was June 24th. I want to say I could be wrong about that, but so I went to the show with my brother. We um, show up there, get COVID tested, the, the quick 15 minute one, you get in there, get COVID tested, run to the show on the other side of the casino, uh, sit down, uh, then there's, there's openers, Donnell Rawlings opened up, was one of the openers. There was multiple people that opened up for, uh, Dave Chappelle. And then, um, Chappelle came out and, and he went through his whole show. And for those people who watched, um, his, his special on Netflix, the closer, um, from what I've heard, I have yet to watch the closer or anything like, or that special specifically on Netflix, but from, kind of the general sense that I got, it was pretty much the same thing that he did at concert and stuff like that. He was just kind of going around the country doing these shows to kind of get his bits like pat down so he could record his special. And so uh, maybe he added or, or subtracted some certain things from when he came to us, but I don't know. I'll have to watch the special. But I say that to kind of also give a background I, I, like I said, Dave Chappelle is probably my favorite comedian. And I can't really tell you when I got into 
comedy and specifically stand-up comedy. I've always liked funny movies and, and Will Ferrell and stuff like that. But I can't say the moment when I got into stand-up comedy and the idea of telling jokes and basically a person on stage producing content and producing entertainment and making people laugh. I know one of the first people that I saw was Dave Chappelle and his Killing Me Softly special. Uh, I think that one was in DC. And I think at that time I might've been either late high school, early college. No, it must've been in high school. Must've been in high school. But I just remember seeing that and being like, man, this guy is good. Like there, there's something different about stand-up comedy where it's just a person, most times it's just a person in a mic and they're able to, to bring these emotions out of people by jokes or by certain things that they say. And it's, it's insane. Like make these people feel these, it's different than what I'm doing right now. I'm not playing on your emotions. I'm just talking and just kind of explaining my thoughts and opinions on certain subjects. But with comedy, it's trying to get you to laugh, trying to make you feel some sort of emotion. And I saw Dave Chappelle for like the first time. And I remember he was really good at doing that. And that's kind of what's sparked my interest and then I heard about the Chappelle show and then I I started watching clips of the Chappelle show on Comedy Central YouTube and I was like man this stuff is insane a lot of the references I I had to look up and I didn't get because it was in the early 2000s and I was such a young kid at the time I just didn't understand but it was I, I loved the show I was a huge fan I I now have um, bought at all the episodes and all from all the seasons and I've watched them all and I love them all. My favorite is probably the reality show one, either that, or I don't know. It's hard to say. I would probably say the, uh, the mad real world, the, the reality show one that they did, that might've been my favorite. Um, but I, I just loved that show and that only, brought my interest more into Chappelle. And so when I was given the opportunity by my fiance at the time to go see Chappelle in person, I was like, I can't do it, man. This is, this is, this had such a big impact on my life. It's hard to even say Chappelle got me and watching this, this person get up on stage and tell these jokes got me into stand-up comedy. And got me into listening to these people's podcasts, got me into Joe Rogan, it got me into people like Tom Segura, Burt Kreischer, Norm MacDonald, all, all these different people, all these different comedians. It brought me to this whole thing that was completely separate from sports. And I love joking around and I love playing around and stuff like that. And to watch these, even old people like George Carlin, one of my favorites, all the stuff he did through the 70s, 80s, I loved it. I loved that style. And then even Richard Pryor. Just just fantastic comedy. Sam Kinison, all these, all these old people that I would that I would listen to and I would enjoy their comedy. Yes, it was from a different time. And they were talking about some references or some things about their life that I didn't know at the time. But there's certain aspects of, of either telling a story and then connecting it back to something you had previously done. Like that's a skill that I really don't have and I can admire because they can go a full, and Chappelle's really good at this, a full 30 minutes into a story and then connect it back to a joke that they told 30 minutes prior. And it's, and it's just insane how they're able to do that. Obviously, it's a lot of writing. It's a lot of repetition. But still, it's something that I wish I really had the skill of being able to do. And so I'm a huge fan of Chappelle. He's definitely one of the reasons why I've gotten so into to comedy. And uh, not that I'm a stand-up comedian or anything like that, but just kind of the, the art form of comedy and kind of what comedy is in the act of um, telling jokes and doing stand-up is uh, he's been 
one of the biggest impacts on my life in that, in that form. And just the huge impact on learning how to laugh at stuff, learning how to laugh at stuff that, um, that necessarily isn't always funny, uh, but learning how to be like, I saw where he was going right there. He was talking about this one thing and then he connected it to this other thing, just kind of the structure of the jokes that they're telling. That's one of the um, big things that I really loved about uh, specifically Dave Chappelle. So to kind of to kind of talk about the uh, performance, yeah, went in the, went into the theater. I was sitting pretty high up, uh, and then Donnell Rawlings came out. Then after that, Dave Chappelle came out. All the lights went off, and uh, it was an incredible, incredible show. Uh, told some really uh, well. Dave Chappelle told some really great uh, stories and certain things of that nature. And I and I was severely, severely um, like, and I've talked about this on my streams before, of being starstruck, even by not meeting people. I, probably one of the first times I was starstruck was when I went to a Penn State game. And uh, they were playing Ohio State. And then Urban Meyer was on the field. And I was like, holy crap. Like, I'm in the same arena as Urban Meyer. Like, this is the guy who's, who's a Hall of Fame coach. He's an absolute college football legend. And I'm in the same place as him. Like, yeah, I'm not going to meet him or anything after the game. But it was just like the, the fact of like, oh, I'm like, this is the real guy. And... And so I had that exact same feeling with not only Dave Chappelle, but also with Donnell. I was like, this is like the real thing. This is actually Dave Chappelle. This is the real dude. And I was like, this is the guy who I've been watching for years. And I've become such a fan of his. And like for a long time, I didn't want to go to his shows uh, because I was, I was nervous that it wouldn't be up to my expectations or something like that. Tickets were so expensive. Uh, but I'm so glad I went to this show and I would definitely go again. I would go a million times. It's just an art form. That's, that's so different from, from sports talk and certain things like that. It's just different, but yeah, I, I love the show. And then after the show, uh, they were kind of walking around and then, um, after the show outside Donnell, was um was kind of taking pictures and signing signing these shirts with people he was selling them as well and and I was there with my brother and I was I um waited in line a very long time a bunch of people cut and passed me and I was like hey I'm not in a rush or anything like like I want to be super respectful I want to like this is this is one of the people who uh, I really look up to as a as a comedian, uh, not because he's he's in the circle of Dave Chappelle, but because of mainly how I know him is from the Chappelle Show, of his certain roles and stuff like that, and I just wanted to kind of reach out, and and I, there was no way for me to express the the impact that he had on me not only in becoming uh wanting to create content or wanting to speak or go into communications or my major or anything like that it's so hard to to especially dave chappelle if dave chappelle was out there i would have had no chance to to even give him a, a smidgen of, of how much he's meant to my life how much he's meant to my career path and certain things that i've done and i'm sure there's millions of people who feel the exact same way so my story wouldn't be wouldn't be like oh what i can't i've never heard that before it's just like so many other people and i find comfort in that that he's been able to change so many other people's lives because there's so many people just like myself out there and uh, i got up waited pretty much to the end of the line to see donnell uh, i got up i shook his hand i said Hey man, like I'm, I'm a huge fan. Thank you so much for, for coming out here tonight. Thank you so much for what you did on the Chappelle show. I'm a huge, huge fan. Um, uh, is it okay if you like sign the shirt for me or something like that? And he was at the table 
uh, people were giving him him shirts and then he would sign it and he would give it to somebody. And then there was people paying for the shirts through Venmo on one side and he was signing shirts and then just give them away. And he, he, there's no way he remembered what I said to him, but for me, that was, that was a, that was a really cool moment for me to be able to meet him and to be able to actually kind of give him some of that gratitude that I had from the uh, content that he's made and um, just the show that he was able to give on previously that night, you know? And then, yeah, we kind of left. And then we went home and that was, I've been to a couple comedy shows in my life and that was by far the best one. Uh, Not just because of how much of a fan of Dave Chappelle I was. It was more so just kind of where my life had brought me. Like to go from somebody who um, had started off hearing about, I know Dave Chappelle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave Chappelle, he's a comedian, right? Yeah. To being able to go to a show and being able to say, hey, man, I've watched every single episode of, episode of the Chappelle show. I've seen uh, both of your, com- I've seen all of your comedy specials on Netflix. And for what it's worth on it, killing me softly on YouTube. Like, man, like you're, you're, you're an absolute legend. And to be able to, to kind of um, be in the, be in the uh, same room and the same presence of, of that was really inspiring on one end, but it was also like such a cool experience. And it's something I, I don't think I'll ever forget. And, but that's such a weird thing. Once you get to that level where if you're on a stage in front of thousands of people, there's, there's gotta be thousands of stories just like mine of these people who, who were, who probably even more different than mine. People were going through tough times like divorces or, or certain things. And they found solace in the Chappelle show or in a special that he did. And it made them laugh and it feels some type of way. They have different stories than I do, and we're all there for different reasons. Yes, we're all there because we like him as a comedian, but some people are there because he changed their life. Like he changed my life. Like comedy in general changed my life. And I'm almost done. And I thought that it was one of the best experiences uh, that I had. Uh, going to see that and I'm, I'm extremely grateful that my fiance at the time got that for me um, but I I thought that it was a really cool experience that I learned a lot about myself and kind of kind of like I'm not alone you know like I'm not alone in in my love and affection for this guy like I don't, I, I can't go out and say anybody appreciates him in the exact same way that I do. Cause I don't think anybody's really had the experience that I do where I found him in high school. Uh, and then I watched all of his stuff and I tried showing it to my friends, like this thing called the Chappelle show. And they were like, what's the Chappelle show? I've heard about it, but like, I haven't watched any of it and sitting them down and be like, look, you have to watch this. Like in the early two thousands, this was the show. And this is what made this guy famous. He's not famous solely due to his stand-up. He's also famous because of this show. And it's not some rinky-dink show. This is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, comedic shows ever. And I, and I felt the need to kind of uh, reach out to my, my friends at the time and kind of say, hey, listen, I, I love this, this stuff. And so, and then kind of moving on a little bit. Uh, just about my thoughts on comedy in general and kind of the art of telling jokes and joking. As there are certain comedians who sometimes they take a break from telling jokes to make people laugh, to make people think or to make a a statement on a certain issue that they care about or certain things like that. And I think there's a lot of times where people know when these certain uh, comedians make that transition, where they're no longer joking, they're out there making a statement about something. 
an outright statement, not to get any laughs. Maybe, maybe the result of it is laughs, but in that that comedian's mind, they're doing it because it's their. This is what they think about a position. This is what their their opinion on on a certain topic is. And that applies not only to Dave Chappelle. That applies to probably every comedian. And I think that there there should be a room allowed for the two. And there's a distinctive difference between the two. Not everybody can tell it. And I'm not saying I'm perfect with it either. I'm definitely not. There's some times where I definitely get that get caught up in it. But there are certain times where you can you can sense the tone is different with these comedians where they're they're joking joking about something and then they kind of slow down their tempo or something like that and then they say hey i i feel this way about this certain thing and and this is why i think this is wrong or this is why i do this or that or this or that where they kind of take a break from the uh telling jokes and trying to make people laugh uh and i think there's definitely room for that you don't have to agree with what they're saying definitely not but I think for people to tell to tell jokes and for people to understand that they're telling jokes, sometimes when people tell jokes, and it's very subjective, definitely not objective, but very subjective for people when they are telling jokes to see if there is a hint of truth in it or if there is a, um, let me lower this down a little bit, see if there is a, a hint of them and their actual feelings coming through the joke and what they kind of think about a certain subject or a certain topic through a joke. That definitely happens as well. But I think it takes knowing a certain comedian, but then also knowing kind of the situation that they're in. If they're joking about something and you can completely tell that they're joking, then that really helps because there are some times where they, they make a joke and then they take a sudden turn to a really serious issue, but they are also kind of using that same kind of voice. And it just takes, just takes, um, just takes a, an ability and an awareness to know when they're actually meaning what they're saying and actually just going out to say something just for comedic effect, something that they, they don't believe, but they're saying it so that it's funny. And I think that that goes for Dave Chappelle. I think that goes for any of the comedians that I, that I listen to. And so I just kind of wanted to, to put that out there as well. Not saying into reference of, of any particular subject or any particular joke that has been made. Just saying that the act of comedy is sometimes mostly to make jokes and to make people laugh. And when you do make a joke, that does not necessarily mean that you troll truly and wholeheartedly believe what you're saying, that that is your absolute 100% opinion on it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Sometimes it, you're, you're joking. Sometimes you're making a joke and that's not actually what you believe, but it's the, the funniest thing in your mind. It could not be in any other's mind. Once again, it's subjective. The funniest thing in your mind to say about a certain topic, a certain uh, situation, a certain anything, that's what you're trying to do. That's ultimately the goal of comedy is to be comedic, to make people laugh. And now some people use it in a different way to, to be funny, but then also merge their opinions about certain issues in it. And they have every single right to do that. There should be, there should be no issue with that whatsoever, whether you agree with their opinions or not. It should be an open source, open communication art form. And I think that's the way it should be, whether I agree with it or not. They could, they could say they hate Zach Moore. Listen, I'd love the free publicity, even if they're not joking. Even if they're not joking, they really mean it. They're like, listen, guys, like I am not joking. I do not like Zachary Moore. And I'd be like, it, freedom of expression man D say what you mean like i obviously i disagree with you and i think i'm i'm an okay person you know and and i do think that i'm i'm all right i think i'm all right i don't i don't think i'm the best at anything i need everything you know 
But what I said earlier kind of was I try to be genuine. I try to be open and honest with um, my audience, uh, no matter how big or how small it is. Uh, there's people that will be watching this in years, years later. And then those will be people who are, who are going to watch this right after I upload this. Uh, but my main thing is just to be open, genuine, honest. And I really like to kind of let my thoughts out whether that's on comedy, whether that's on performance enhancing drugs, whether that's on the James Webb Space Telescope, whether that's on the Brown Steelers game this weekend. I just want to give my thoughts on everything. And I kind of wanted to um, hop on tonight to kind of reach out and give like an update on my life and kind of my thoughts on everything. Like I didn't t- give too much of a life update. Like I'm Hanging out, still living in Pittsburgh, still working out, hanging out. Uh, and then kind of the future of where this is going to go. Um, I would like, I'd prefer to do a podcast like every week, like every Saturday or something like that. But it's sometimes hard, especially like right now I'm, 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 uh, I'm home alone right now. Like I don't have any distractions, but on certain weekends, there might be stuff that I have to do such as shopping and getting and getting other things in order. So I will do my best to do like a, at least one podcast every week. And so this will go up on YouTube. This will go up on my Patreon. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of, to close this out, say, um, Thank you so much for, for listening. If you're listening um, right after I upload this, like within 30 minutes after, or even if you're years later uh, in the year 2040 or something like that, uh, I really do appreciate each and every single person who listens to this, uh, just like I mentioned with Dave Chappelle. Each and every person who listens to Dave Chappelle has a different reason why they're listening to him, and they have a different appreciation than I do. And that's the same with the people who listen to me. If you're listening to me to, to work out, to go to the gym with, I mean, I listen to podcasts when I go to the gym. I don't listen to music. I listen to, to people express their ideas and their opinions. And I hope, you, I hope you find what I say interesting. And I hope you find what I say genuine because this is my genuine thoughts and opinion. I'm not holding anything. I'm not saying anything just to say it to be, to be anything. This is my thoughts on PEDs, bodybuilding, James Webb, and everything. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, for listening, man. Uh, you guys, everybody have a have a great night, and uh, thank you so much.